As you have heard in the introduction, our topic, the impacts of climate change, are feared to increase conflicts. Frequent and more extreme weather conditions, natural disasters are expected to disproportionately affect vulnerable people and communities in low-income countries. They are the least prepared to mitigate and adapt to these impacts, and they have least contributed to the problem. And where state capacity and socioeconomic development are already low anyway, climate change is also feared to increase the risk of organized armed conflicts and exacerbate existing tensions. In this session, we hear from researchers who have been focusing on the impact of climate change in relation to migration, weather, and public health. So, regarding the format, um, each speaker will have 10 to 15 minutes for their presentations. Then we have um, a little debate and discussion uh, amongst ourselves, and then we will include uh, the audience and welcome questions from you either here uh, in the room or uh, virtually. I'm delighted that we have a panel of uh, several exciting and creative scientists in their respective fields. We have uh, Barbara Sedova, the project co-lead of the Weathering Risk Project and co-lead of the Future Lab um, on security, ethnic conflicts and migration at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. And um, she'll be speaking about the Weathering Risk Initiative. Then we have here, in Basel, uh, Klaus Kramer, Managing Director of the Sight and Life Foundation and adjunct professor uh, of the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. He'll be talking about health and nutrition. You have seen him already in uh, the panel of the day. And then, last but not least, we have Roman Hoffman, postdoctoral researcher at the uh, International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis and the Vienna Institute of Democracy, uh, Demography, and he'll be speaking about migration and urbanization. So we'll be taking it from there. Our first speaker, uh, our first virtual speaker, will be Barbara Sedova. So good afternoon, everyone. Let me start uh, by sharing my screen. All right, I hope you can all see my slides. Um, uh, I'm delighted to, uh, well, first of all, I would like to uh, thank you for inviting, uh, inviting me. I'm uh, very happy to present you today the Weathering uh, Risk Initiative to showcase how novel climate information products and uh, machine learning can help the analysis of climate-related conflict. So um, the evidence is growing that um, the multiple climate change uh, impacts um, aggravate conflicts um, by um, exacerbating conflict drivers, um, including inequality, food insecurity, diminishing natural resources and displacement. Um, the figure um, illustrates how over the past 25 years, regions experiencing droughts have overlapped with areas experiencing civil conflicts. We can also illustrate this um, in terms of numbers. Um, as of December 2020, six out of 10 biggest UN peace operations were in countries that are ranked as the most uh, exposed to climate change, according to the uh, Peace Research Institute, CIPRI. These risks uh, can, cascades, uh, can cascade across countries' borders, as illustrated uh, in, in this slide. We find a positive linear relationships be between um, the proportion of the population that experience conflict-related displacement and the proportion of the population that left the country uh, in the same time period. 
with increasing risk of conflict in a changing climate, uh, we can expect that, sub uh, that substantial. We can expect a substantial increase in international migration, which could increase risks to peace and security if not managed well. As mentioned earlier, in addition to migration, there are numerous other drivers uh, of conflict that are being continuously aggravated by climate change, uh, including um, increasing inequality, food insecurity. Um, and diminishing natural resources in addition to displacement, as I illustrated before. Um, and as you can see on this figure um, from the recently published chapter of the sixth uh, IPCC report, um, global surface temperature has already increased by more than one degree uh, Celsius relative to the pre-industrial times, and we are at a serious uh, risk of exceeding the one and a half degrees uh, warming threshold. And cross crossing this threshold, uh, we're very likely activate dangerous tipping points that could trigger impacts of unprecedented scale. And in order to minimize peace and security risks in a changing climate now and in the future, it is crucial um, to understand when and how these risks um, uh, emerge. Uh, this would allow us to support early warning and early action. And um, to, to make matters even more complicated, um, the risk landscape is continuously changing uh, as the current COVID-19 uh, situation has uh, demonstrated. Um, and um, yeah, the COVID-19 is basically just... Uh, 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 the most recent manifestation of the new risk landscape unfolding in front of us. Um, therefore, uh, we need to act now. We need a focused action to better understand the climate, peace, and security linkages. This would enable us to improve foresight and preventive action and in enhance resilience uh, of the most vulnerable populations, sectors, and institutions. And this is where we step in with our Weathering Risk Initiative. Um, Weathering Risk Initiative is a glo global climate and security risk and foresight assessment. Um, the initiative is uh, led by um, Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research and by a consultancy located in Berlin uh, called Adelphi and is conducted in a very close collaboration with the German Federal Foreign Office. And on this slide, you can... Uh, see uh, the report that um, kick-started the project. Um, we issued this report, uh, which summarizes um, the state-of-the-art evidence on the highly contextual impacts uh, of climatic events on peace and security. So if you're interested, uh, you can, um, yeah, you can uh, see it on our website. Um, so weathering risk uh, follows three main objectives. Uh, first, it seeks to improve the understanding and the analysis of how climate change impacts peace and aggravates conflict in order to support risk-informed planning. Second, um, the initiative seeks to improve the capacity of decision makers to act on climate and security in the affected regions. And third, the initiative aims to deepen the considerations of climate, sustainable development, security, and peace building as cross-cutting issues in all operational responses. So how do we do that? Um, we have developed a replicable uh, methodology to assess climate-related security risks now and in the future. Um, this methodology is uh, currently being piloted in the field and is freely available on our website for end users and stakeholders who want to conduct climate uh, security assessment independently. Um, in our assessment, uh, we consider three different types of uh, um, timescales. Uh, so the short uh, timescale captures the next four years, the medium term uh, timescale captures the next five to 10 years, and the long term timescales uh, captures the next uh, 20 to 80 years. So um, the innovative aspect of the veteran risk approach is that we combine various state of the art methods uh, from quantitative quantitative and qualitative research, um, including a localized uh, conflict analysis, uh, physical climate impact modeling, machine learning, and elements of foresight. 
uh, we have uh, conducted a pilot assessment in Mali and another assessment is currently underway in Somalia. And other, other analyses are planned, uh, for instance, in Colombia or uh, in Iraq. And we also want to conduct a sectoral assessment uh, focusing, for instance, on migration or uh, food sector. So these are the uh, five steps of our bettering risk methodology. And um, the Potsdam Institute, uh, for which I speak today, um, um, is in charge of the step one and uh, step three. So in charge of the qual quantitative elements of the methodology. Um, and I will give you a bit of a deep dive in the next couple of slides. Um, so as for the climate impact research, um, we are collaborating with the um, Agrica project um, at the, sorry, at the um, Potsdam Institute. Um, the goal of this step is to assess climate impacts and related risks uh, in a short, medium and long term in countries and regions where our as assessment is piloted. Um, to do this, we draw on data and modeling capacities uh, from the ISMIT project at the Potsdam Institute. So um, what does the ISMIT project do? Um, so the project summarizes climate change impacts now and in the future. Um, under different uh, climate change uh, scenarios across different, different um, climate models. And in collaboration uh, with the Agrica project, as I mentioned, we generate so-called cl climate risk profiles um, to feed into uh, the next steps uh, of the weathering risk analysis. Um, for uh, regions of uh, interest, we provide geographically explicit uh, condensed overview of present and future climate impacts uh, at, for different sectors. Um, here is an uh, example of what kind of information is included in our climate risk profiles. Um, so this slide illustrates uh, um, uh, information on Mali that we used in our pilot assessment. And to give you a bit, uh, a bit more of uh, information, here you can see projections of water availability from precipitation per capita uh, uh, until the year 2080. And figure A, a on the left-hand side uh, assumes um, the national population does not change. And figure B on the right-hand side assumes changing population in line with the SSP2 scenario. Uh, the red line corresponds to the RCP6, uh, uh, which is medium to high emission pathway. And the, uh, the blue line corresponds to RCP2.6, which is compatible with the Paris Agreement. And um, yeah, assuming constant, po constant population, uh, projection suggest that only suggest only a slight decrease in water availability over Mali by the end of the century under both emission scenarios when accounting for population growth in line with the projections per capita availability of water for Mali is projected to decline substantially. Um, so what do we do with this kind of climate impact information? Um, uh, we uh, basically create different pathways uh, in order to understand through in which context uh, these climatic pressures, pressures um, could lead to conflict. And um, yet another illustration um, um, how, climate, how these climate risk profiles that we generate um, provide also geographically explicit information um, um, on climate impacts. And um, this enables us to assess uh, geographically which areas are uh, most likely to be um, at risk and uh, yeah, as I mentioned, we uh, do not only have climate impact projections for uh, water availability, but also for other different sectoral impacts, including uh, mortality risk, um, including um, agricultural, agricultural production and, uh, and um, all sorts of other impacts um, that, that might be of interest for a conflict analysis assessment. Um, and now, um, as a last part of my talk, I will give you a bit of uh, a detail of what we do on the ma machine learning front um, uh, for the weathering risk project. So uh, we use generalized uh, random forest algorithm 
to evaluate the eligibility of extreme weather events uh, relative to the conventional predictors of conflict, such as socioeconomic governance, uh, governance and history of conflict indicators in order to predict conflict incidents in mainland Africa. Our analysis was run between the years 2002 and 2012 um, in order to see how well the, the extreme weather events uh, perform relative to the other indicators to predict conflict. Um, and this figure, the figure on the left hand side of the slide, uh, shows that the result of this analysis uh, shows the result of this analysis at different administrative levels, uh, as the x-axis illustrate. Uh, from national and um, from the, it goes from the national level on the complete left hand side to the more um, uh, sort of uh, nuanced levels, uh, sub national levels uh, um, to the right hand side. And um, uh, yeah, uh, on the y axis, you see the area under the receiver operator curve. It is a metric used to evaluate forecasts of conflict, where, uh, whereby what you need to remember is that higher values indicate better performance of an indicator um, uh, to predict conflicts. And these different colors um, uh, capture different, um, different conflict indicator categories. So the one that we are interested in is the, is the green one. Um, uh, so uh, completely, uh, uh, when you look at the right-hand side of the figure, it's the second one from the bottom. Um, and uh, and yeah, and we have different uh, lines for each uh, predictor categories because we look at different uh, four different definitions of conflict. And maybe this was too much technicalities, uh, so I will just give you the what we find. So the the results suggest that socio indi the socioeconomic indicators perform the best in forecasting conflict, followed by governance indicators, and then by extreme weather event. Uh, conflict history, which is thought to be um, the best predictor of conflict in the literature, performs quite well at the national levels, but relatively poorly at the district and municipality le uh, levels. And this basically implies that conflict history is good at telling us that there will be a future conflict in a given country, uh, but it doesn't perform. It is not uh, good in telling us um, in which specific district on, or town this conflict uh, conflict will happen. Uh, on the other hand, um, extreme weather, weather events do not perform as well at the national level, but they perform quite well at a subnational level um, uh, and help us to localize conflicts fairly well. And um, yeah, so this is. Um, this was just a broad, uh, uh, sorry, um, just a short snapshot in our uh, weathering risk initiative and what we do there. And um, you can see uh, more of our outputs on our website, so uh, weatheringrisk.org. <laughs> and yeah, thanks for your attention. This is all from my side for now. Thank you very much, Barbara. That was fascinating. I already have lots of questions that we can elaborate on, hopefully, more. Let's move over to health and nutrition. Klaus Kramer. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you very much, um, Oliver, and thanks to the organizer for inviting me. Um, I'm speaking about um, yeah, climate change and public health, specifically public health nutrition today. Um, we have uh, in the next slide an, um, an infographic on climate change and how climate change is uh, affecting different aspects we are talking uh, about today, including uh, yeah, uh, migration and conflict. And my topic is right on the left-hand side. It's about um, the undernutrition specifically. We are working in low- and middle-income countries on improving nutrition. And nutrition is a complex endeavor. It's not only about providing food. It's also about people eating the right kind of food and keeping a healthy lifestyle. Uh, when we talk about climate change, then it's important that uh, food uh, 
production is a major contributor to uh, greenhouse gas emission. The whole food system is contributing about one third of all greenhouse gases, but at the same time, climate change is also uh, reducing food security and nutrition. And specifically, the production of animal source food, and uh, many will refer to, to beef production or dairy production, is having the largest uh, climate impact. But there are also uh, initiatives to reduce the climate impact through the use of uh, specific uh, feeds for the animals to uh, reduce methane from ruminants, for instance. So we have also scenarios um, that uh, include the type of food we eat on the uh, ability to reach the 1.5 or 2 uh, degrees centigrade of increase of global temperature where food security um, is a major issue. And just mentioning one aspect, the amount of food waste and loss is contributing 10% uh, to greenhouse gas emission. So we have the means to reduce the losses and the waste to a significant degree in the meantime, but uh, we also have to make sure that we, we feed rather nourish people right. So working in a low and middle income context, we are primarily concerned about children uh, growing to their full potential. And this is growing tall. And we have about 150 million children under the age of five that are stunted. They are short for their age. And stunting is uh, directly correlated to uh, cognitive development to brain development, and the World Bank use it also as an indicator for human capital development. So this is a major target, and it's also a target of sustainable development uh, goal too. But we also have wasted children. They are severely malnourished, and severe malnourishment is a leading cause of child mortality. And we have also children that are overweight and obese, and this is leading to risks of non communicable diseases like diabetes or the cardiovascular disease, also in later life. And at the same time, at the global level, we have about yeah, more than 2 billion uh, adults are overweight and obese with the risk of non communicable diseases. And these diseases, non communicable diseases, are also happening in low- and middle-income countries, are in the meantime the uh, major factor of, of death. When we look at the progress we make in uh, alleviating malnutrition, then the world is absolutely not on track. We have uh, global targets by the World Health Assembly that have been adopted by uh, the uh, Sustainable Development Goals, and child stunting, for instance, anemia in women, or low birth weight, and uh, childhood overweight, and childhood wasting, that we don't have progress, is stagnant. And we have now, some people call it a toxic cocktail of COVID-19 pandemic and climate change and conflict, leading to more severe undernutrition and malnutrition. And there are estimates that just due to the COVID pandemic, we have uh, additional 3.5 million stunted children and uh, 13.6 million wasted children and almost 300,000 additional child deaths under the age of five years, within the next three years. When we talk about uh, food security and nutrition, then we have to talk about diet quality. It's not about just providing uh, calories, and calories are typically relatively cheap in the form of grains and, and fats and oils. We talk rather about a high-quality diet. A healthy diet constitutes of, uh, of grains, pulses, some animal source food, fruit and vegetable, and that has uh, the lowest risk of uh, undernutrition, but also the lowest risk of overnutrition and uh, non communicable diseases. And these are um, issues that we are facing with the affordability of diets. Three billion people cannot afford a healthy diet, and even two billion people cannot afford a nutrient adequate diet. This is largely a starchy diet based on, on cereals and tubers, but these diets are typically low in essential vitamins and minerals, what we call micronutrients. And given the situation with an increasing number of uh, weather shocks and the, the pandemic, 
uh, diets are getting more and more healthy diets uh, unaffordable. And uh, what we have seen uh, due in the pandemic, and I have to refer to it, uh, there is an increased uh, cost of food, and these are the FAO uh, food price indices, and over the last few years since the pandemic starts, when countries uh, were hoarding uh, food or the supply chain uh, were disrupted, food prices have increased. And that has reminded me of the Arab Spring uh, about a decade ago, uh, when there were increases in food prices leading to, to food riots, and uh, eventually to a totally changed landscape in the Middle East. And when we move to the topic of the contribution of diet to, um, to health issues, like non-comical diseases or chronic diseases, and a contribution to, to planetary health, we have had a, a panel that was hosted by, the, by EAT, and uh, Lancet, the Eat Lancet Commission, and they developed a diet called the Eat Lancet Planetary Health Diet. And this diet is uh, largely um, plant-based, some animal source food, for example. Um, with this diet, we can consume a quarter of an egg a day. Uh, and full egg is about 60 grams, and this would be 13 grams a day of an egg. So it's a large decrease in animal source food, which is important to improve um, health, specifically in high-income countries where we have affluence with the access to, to animal source food. But for low- and middle-income countries, we have to uh, admit that there's a need also of animal source food, specifically for young children who have a small stomach. They need nutrient-dense food with high quality, and also for pregnant and lactating women who need better uh, diets. And looking at this yeah, Eat uh, Lancet Planetary Health Diet that tries to accommodate both planetary and human health, we have an affordability issue. The cost of this diet, uh, this is an assessment from, from IFPRI uh, in, in Washington, is um, just too high, it exceeds the income of 1.6 billion people globally with a majority in, in Sub-Saharan Africa and in South Asia. So we have also to be conscious, are diets, healthy diets affordable to the poor specifically? It has been proposed and there's an increasing trend to replace uh, uh, animal source food by animal source uh, food mimics like a, 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 a burger um, made from, from, uh, from peas, pea protein, or eggs made from soybean protein. Then we have uh, fermented uh, protein sources, and we have uh, alternatives to, to, to milk in different forms like almond uh, drinks or um, oat drinks. And there is uh, algae is, uh, uh, is in the market. We have uh, uh, crickets and other insects are increasingly populating the market and lab-grown meat. But these kind of foods are emerging in high-income countries first, but we're also seeing them emerging in low-income countries. And they're my biggest concern raises because they are not as nutritious as their natural counterpart. And these products have been um, in the critique quite recently, also by the World Health Organization. Uh, we have also written about it because they are highly processed, contain high amounts of salt, sugar, and, uh, fat, uh, and saturated fat. So there's a need to consider whether we really should uh, eat whole food instead of this highly processed food. Oh, two minutes. And um, an egg is a highly nut uh, nutrient-dense food, which is a perfect food for a young child. And together with breast milk, uh, it can meet almost all essential nutrient requirements. And we have also a, quite a number of studies in the meantime that show that egg consumption among young children can significantly reduce stunting, and in one study, even about 50%. So there's a potential. If we place the food at the right place, then we have an ability to improve 
nutrition also in low in income countries. But these eggs are typically still too expensive and uh, there's work ongoing to make eggs more available and more uh, affordable. But comparing um, the impact of, uh, of protein on, um, on greenhouse gas emission, we have also to be cautious whether we are making the right comparison. If we compare um, different kind of animal source food or plant-based uh, foods uh, with the protein content, it's a different picture as when we compare this with an um, amino acid, it's an essential amino acid which is important for building up uh, your human uh, body protein. Then there's also an issue, where do we uh, produce food? This is a, a, a slide that summarizes the greenhouse gas emission from, um, from beef production in different countries. And uh, looking at uh, high uh, productivity countries uh, for beef and dairy production, like Switzerland or Denmark, then we have in relative terms less of greenhouse gas emission compared to one country, Paraguay, for instance, where we have in relative terms the highest greenhouse gas emission. So it's a, also a matter of the production system. We are specifically concerned about vitamins and minerals and micronutrients, and uh, the climate change has a tremendous effect not only on the amount of food that is produced, but also on the quality of food. And the availability of micronutrients uh, through uh, yeah, changes in the food supply is declining. Uh, when we see uh, a change in, uh, in temperature, global temperature and carbon dioxide, because it's all affecting the composition also of these foods. So we have a double detriment. It's not only the quantity, but we also have the quality that is uh, altered due to climate change, where we have a real concern going into the future. One aspect that is largely ignored, this is food safety, but climate change and uh, uh, humid weather is also contributing to the contamination of food, like here with uh, mold, Con, uh, producing a, uh, a mycotoxin called aflatoxin, which has a detrimental effect on the liver, like liver cancer, but also is leading uh, to a lack of immune function. So I'm done almost. One aspect I wanted to share uh, is we are, we are working on uh, nutrition in uh, secondary cities, nutrition in, uh, in uh, City Ecosystems, which is an SDG-funded project with a number of Swiss organizations like the Tropical Institute, ETH Zurich, and Syngenta Foundation on transforming the value chain specifically for improving nutrition in cities and generating demand for more nutritious food uh, produced with uh, the condition of agroecology and this is also aiming to increase um, the um, employment, specifically among youth and, and women. This is a summary on the potential solutions, and one is the production system we have to consider, but agroecology has still to, to demonstrate that it's really nourishing uh, everyone at an affordable cost. And Biofortification is breeding of plants to increase more vitamins and minerals, but fortification is after harvest when vitamins and minerals are added. Switzerland was the first country with fortification of table salt with iodine starting in 1922, so it's a, it's a common approach to improve dietary quality. Supplementation, nutrient profiling, labeling to inform consumer and generate better demand for better dietary choices. And we need also look into crops resistance to stress and of course the massive loss of food uh, and uh, waste that is contributing to climate catastrophes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's move right over to Roman Hoffmann, Migration and Urbanization.
Okay, good. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much um, for the invitation to give a talk today. Thank you to the organizers and also thanks to the previous speakers. And I'm looking forward to the exchange later. I would like to speak about the links between climate change and migration and discuss implica implications of these links for urbanization patterns worldwide and the consequences um, that cities face that emerge from the link um, between climate change and migration. Um, before I start, I would like to highlight five key points that I would like to make during my presentation. Climate change can indeed be an important migration driver, but there is complex relations. Not everyone affected by environmental change processes and environmental hazards actually migrates. And often we have to look into more detail into the local context and conditions to better understand who is migrating, migrating under which conditions and what are the consequences both for migrants but also their origin communities. It is in many cases local conditions and also household characteristics that shape migration responses. Um, and when we look at climate-driven migration, um, then we need to understand that there is a close link um, to urbanization processes more widely. And this is one important point that I will speak about as this is also uh, a main focus of the session today. And with these changes, we see that there's new risks and challenges coming, um, particularly for urban contexts. And these include new climatic risks as well that may lead in some contexts to um, new displacements and new forms of migration. In the past years, we have all seen um, major changes in our climatic conditions across the world. And um, there has been an unprecedented uh, warming trend that as the IPCC writes, has been unprecedented for at least the last 2000 years, if not more. These trends have significant impacts all across the world, as you can see here in the map, that also stems from um, the IPCC report, um, the fifth assessment report, where you can see that climate impacts really affect the entire globe, but to a different uh, magnitude and different issues are of relevance um, in different contexts. We see impacts on physical systems, biological systems, and also human, human and managed systems, as we have heard just before, for example, impacts on food security and nutrition. Not everyone affected by these changes also experiences an impact. It is not only natural factors that we need to take into account here, but very importantly, also socioeconomic factors and processes that shape whether populations are exposed to a certain hazard and whether they are vulnerable to it. Here, issues such as social inequality and poverty also have an important role to determine the climate risk of different population groups. Under certain conditions, impacts can become so severe that people do not have any other opportunity, other choice, but to migrate away from the hazardous area and to find um, 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 survival in other regions. In our research, we, we find that indeed in many regions of the world, there is a close connection between changes in environmental and climatic conditions and migration dynamics and more broadly, different forms of human mobility. So what you see here in this map um, is um, migration patterns that we linked with different uh, changes in environmental conditions in different areas of the world, and where we see that there is um, um, closely aligned patterns. However, the strength and the direction of the relationship, as we find it in our research, very much depends on local conditions and also the type and intensity of the experience environmental influences. So there is no general conclusion that one can derive if environmental change processes drive migration, but one, as I said before, really has to very closely look at the local context and understand um, what the motivation of the people are and why they migrate and what the role is of environmental factors and climatic changes. There is a variety of different factors that can affect a household's decision to migrate or not to migrate. These range from environmental factors to political, demographic, economic, and social and sociopolitical factors. The conflict dynamics, as Barbora has mentioned them in her talk at the beginning, also play an important role here and has, have been uh, at, the, at the focus of, of much research on environmental migration in the past years. What we see is that migration is really embedded in social processes and closely related also to other population dynamics. 
What is important is that not every household and not every community that experiences an environmental hazard decides or migrates, shows changes in migration patterns. There's a range of other factors that determine what happens. On one side, there might be people deciding to migrate. This can either be out of a voluntary decision or out of a co coercion that they are forced to leave their homes because they have no other choices. So that's a common distinction we are making in the literature. In the latter case, we are speaking of displacement. Or we see, and this is by far in many cases the largest part of the population, that people do not migrate and do not change their migration behavior. And here the question is, why is that? Are the people not affected by the environmental change process or the hazard? Do they not have a migration incentive? Or do they maybe have a very strong motivation to stay, which is of course also um, a, a very important reason for not migrating? Or are they what we refer to trapped? That is populations that do not have sufficient resources to finance the migration and hence may become trapped in um, hazardous conditions in the origin regions. When we talk about the topic climate change and migration, we need to take all different groups, mobile and mobile, into account to really fully understand what the impacts of climate change are on different population groups and migration dynamics. The World Bank has estimated that with continued climate change and without any immediate actions, there might be as many as 260 million people internally migrating within the borders of their countries until 2050. Um, while this, these estimates are always related to quite a high uncertainty as they are based on forecasting methods, um, they still give us an indication of um, the importance of this topic of climate-induced migration patterns worldwide. We see in particular at a, at a geographical scale that regions in the global south, including the Sahel zone, the populous uh, countries in South Asia, as well as selected countries in Southeast Asia and Latin America and the Caribbean are particularly affected um, and uh, may see major increases in climate induced mobility in the future. These trends also have important implication for urbanization processes and cities. Climate related migration, and this is also what our research clearly shows, is primarily internal. That is changing environmental and socioeconomic factors are mainly driving um, migration within um, the borders of a country. And many migrants are turning towards cities in their migration. So environmentally induced, climate induced migration is driving urbanization to a certain extent. At the same time, we see that of course also there exist feedback loops. That is, if we have increased urbanization patterns on one side, then this again affect both local environments, for example, ecological conditions in cities, but it also has important implications um, for climate change mitigation and protection. Here I've brought you from one of our recent um, publications, um, an overview of urbanization trends across three major regions, where you can see that in particular in Africa and Middle East and South and Eastern Asia, urbanization trends have been quite rapid and strong in the past um, decades. So we see substantive urbanization that is substantive urban growth in those areas. Particularly, Africa, um, um, Africa cities in Africa are growing at a rapid pace. Here I've brought you, I've plotted against, again, the, the, the map um, with the urbanization trends by countries. And uh, what you can see in addition here is the 20 most fastest growing cities in, in Africa. All of these cities that I've depicted here in this map are expected to double in size in the next 15 years to come. And here we have a number of cities that already host um, more than several million inhabitants. So these changes are quite substantive when it comes to absolute changes in population sizes in these urban areas. For example, in Dar es Salaam, which has 6.7 million inhabitants at the moment, we expect over the next 15 years, um, a 100% increase in the population size. And um, I invite all of you to imagine what this means for a city to grow that rapidly in such a short amount of time. Um, I'm living in Vienna, for example, and uh, it's, it's barely imaginable what would these trends would uh, imply for a city like Vienna over such a short period of time. They come also for those cities that are affected with a host of different challenges related to housing issues, new health risks, transportation issues, 
pollution, security issues, and of course the provision of public services. All of these topics nicely tie in also to the previous two talks that we heard, and we can discuss them more in detail later at the plenary. Also, what is important is that the increasing urbanization trends come with new climate risks and new challenges related to climate resilience. Often migrants that come into cities live under deprived uh, um, conditions, for example, in informal set settlements in the periphery of many of these fast growing cities, where they are exposed to also major impacts of climate change. And how to increase um, climate res resilience in those communities is one of the main um, tasks that we will be facing in the near future. The, the climate risk these communities are exposed to can also lead to displacement in an urban context, so urban displacement. Here I've brought you to the right a figure from the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center where they have compared displacement uh, risks or displace displacements in urban settings with those in rural settings, which are uh, the first ones in yellow, the second one in gray. We can see that actually already today, the largest share of displacements occur in urban environments, highlighting the need to really take a closer look at, um, at, at these uh, risks and challenges faced by urban communities. Um, to conclude, I would like to highlight um, different policy implications. And when it comes to addressing the environmental change, migration, urbanization nexus, holistic solutions are required that consider really the connections between different systems and different policy domains while promoting just uh, climate transitions. And with different systems, this also includes looking at both origin areas, where do the people come from, as well as destination areas where are people migrating to, to, in particular, as I described, urban areas, which will see um, um, a large increase in migrants in the future. In particular, it's about strengthening climate resilience and adaptive capacities. It's about finding ways to better build sustainable and efficient communities and cities. It's about improving resilience in cities, but also in origin areas. It's about, of course, also the strengthening and protection, um, the strengthening of the protection and inclusion of migrants um, who are one of the most vulnerable groups in many settings. And this, for example, what is very important here, and this is also an emphasis of, of our work, is the enhancement of education and skill sets to allow migrants to better integrate into labor markets in urban settings. And finally, it's important to really take a holistic approach that builds on synergies between different policy domains and to take a comprehensive perspective on the entire matter. And with this, I would like to stop here and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Roman. So we'll be um, discussing very briefly amongst ourselves before uh, opening it up to, um, to you, the participants. Um, fascinating, very different topics, some overlap. Um, first of all, I would like to give um, the three panelists uh, the occasion possibility to comment on each other or ask questions or give um, you know some input from their perspective Klaus Roman Barbara should I start yes please yeah um, I'm so fascinated about the interdependencies mm -hmm. and um, I really think it's so important to not sitting in, in our silos, talking about food and nutrition, but we have to link it to climate changes and to the risk of, of conflicts and, and to migration. And specifically, uh, improving systems in the agriculture and food sector can increase the resilience to climate change if we consider also technologies that would potentially um, reduce the water losses, like drip irrigation, is, uh, is something what's typically uh, mentioned to reduce um, water losses and reduce uh, water use in, in food production. But also, at the same time, we need for young people, women specifically, decent jobs. And the agriculture and food sector can provide decent jobs 
and that requires to build capacity, basic um, training, but also training in entrepreneurship that gives the opportunity to, to create own businesses. And we need entrepreneurs, and there are so many young people coming out of school and even university in Sub-Saharan Africa, India, and other places of the world who need, urgently need a job. Mm -hmm. And using the opportunity of the ag food sector to develop th these jobs and also train them in improving the quality of food during processing uh, to yeah, make people healthier, mm -hmm. then I think we have uh, already some important uh, yeah, twitch or loop that we can build. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, Barbara? So I would like to directly uh, follow up on uh, Klaus' um, input. Um, and I think uh, I'm, I completely agree that um, improving access to technology or um, considering um, or making policies that are gender sensitive, uh, but also um, foreseeing urbanization and uh, migration in a changing climate, all of these aspects are um, um, fundamental in improving uh, resilience um, of households uh, in low and middle income countries. And I, I see there are a lot of synergies with the work that we are trying to do within the Veteran Risk Project, um, as all of these elements um, would help to uh, prevent, prevent conflicts. Because um, uh, malnutrition or um, uncontrolled migration, um, lack of access to technology, all of these aspects have been uh, um, shown to increase or have been shown to be drivers um, of risks to peace and security. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, Roman? Thank you. Um, I also think that one of the important points from all of the talk is the close interconnectedness between all of these different issues that we've mm. been looking at. And also the understanding that when we talk about climate change, it's really about compound and possibly cascading risks that many um, communities and populations are potentially exposed to, and that one needs to basically have a comprehensive understanding of how these come together and how these influence the livelihoods of the people and also their decision making in the end. And I also agree that it is really important to build adaptive capacities and to strengthen the resilience of populations, so to give them their, the, the, the possibility to also deal with these issues also in their own rights, um, so to not necessarily only basically deliver these um, from, from the outside, but also help them to to increase their own resilience and uh, to develop their own um, system strength um, facing, facing these dire risks in different domains. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, resilience is something that, that came up in, the, uh, uh, in different, uh, different feedback. Um, I was wondering, is, is, um, is your project talking to the weather risk project? Could that, uh, are you developing like a similar database or could the weather risk project give input into, into your migration issues? Absolutely. No, we're also working closely together, Barbara and mm. I, so we try really to push in many of these areas um, into new domains. Of course, it's a lot also about, um, for us researchers, um, finding good data sources that would allow us to then connect these different issues. Data is in many of these uh, fields a uh, challenge still, although there has been now uh, major improvements uh, in the past years, so we see improved access to migration data, for example, that is more com comprehensive. And uh, we're working closely together to better understand um, also across disciplines um, what the drivers are of migration, what the drivers are of conflict, and how they can mutually reinforce each other, how they depend on each other. Um, just to, to emphasize that again, again, interdisciplinarity, transdisciplinarity is really um, key here, um, having basically researchers from different domains coming together We've mentioned uh, before, um, the agriculture sector is, uh, of course, quite important. You need to have agriculture scientists, you need to have climate scientists uh, to understand these processes. You need to have social scientists all coming together um, to, to, to find solutions and answers to some of these questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks. 
Um, I have one question um, for Barbara. I was fascinated by the, um, the, the weather risk uh, database. Um, could you elaborate? No? I'm here, I'm here. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit more on that on that machine learning component? How you how you link you know the weather risk with the 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 concrete um, conflict risk or the or the or the or the yeah conflict um, aspects? You know you mentioned these these uh, pathways. Um, I would be interested in in finding out a little bit more how how you make that um, connection. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. So, um, in the machine learning exercise, as I mentioned, uh, we uh, basically try to understand uh, which group of predictors of conflict um, performs the best and uh, to what extent um, we can uh, sort of uh, take extreme weather events, which have been so uh, shown in the research, to aggravate the risk of conflict. Um, uh, to what extent we can take them and uh, um, sort of uh, understand them as, as causes of, of conflict. And, and what, we, what we learned from this machine learning exercise is that um, uh, even though they have an important predictive power, um, they do not sort of, um, uh, they do not uh, contain unique information uh, to predict conflict, which, uh, which is not included in other socioeconomic or governance indicators. So, mm -hmm. so to summarize this, we understand that um, extreme weather events are uh, sort of um, uh, aggravating the risk of conflicts, but uh, they do not, uh, they are not the, the root causes, so to say. And um, using this information uh, helps us to understand what's going on on the ground. So for instance, in one of the steps of the weathering a risk initiative, um, we, we go to the field and try to analyze uh, what's happening. Uh, we have these maps uh, where climatic risks are the highest. So we, we are able to identify the areas. Uh, as you have seen, we are a, um, uh, extreme weather events have uh, helped the localization of conflicts. Mm -hmm. But then we know once we have identified these areas, we need to look into um, socioeconomic and governance indicators um, to understand why here and not somewhere else uh, extreme weather events uh, contribute to conflict. Hmm. So it would be something like relatively classic conflict analysis in regions that that are strongly impacted by these by these uh, extreme weather events. That, that that would be the basis. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. And, and um, I mean, the novel aspect is that we are using really these, um, uh, like in addition to machine learning, we are also using this um, climate impact uh, analysis, which we conduct together with the Agrica project, which uh, uses data at uh, approximately 50 times 50 kilometer resolution, uh, which is uh, quite precise to, to understand where these hotspots uh, could um, or already are and could be in the future, depending on the climate change scenario. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Klaus, I was fascinated by your uh, side comment about like the Arab, Arab Spring uprising, as as uh, you know, got kicked off by in in in, in many cases by by uh, uh, increase of um, of food, food prices. prices yeah. Is, do, do you have other examples uh, uh, of that or, or other examples of like a, a, a direct link between, you know, kind of food cost, health, nutrition and um, conflict? This is the only example that comes immediately to mm -hmm. my mm -hmm. mind. Others are probably more uh, focused. And it was a series of uh, food rights that happened uh, about a decade and more ago. Um, we have other examples that uh, food price spikes, food inflations, uh, contributed significantly to undernutrition and to, to child mortality. Mm -hmm. And that is a significant concern. When we see food prices increasing, then 
in the aftermath, we see more undernutrition and death in these countries. Mm -hmm. But I'm also listening to Barbara specifically that the social economic aspects, um, the core, and others are uh, like climate uh, uh, weather events are the tipping point. And certainly um, in, during the Arabic Spring, uh, we had a, the, there was a social economic issue, rising food crisis, uh, prices, and then the other uh, element that did uh, cause the roi food rights, that was is difficult to analyze hmm. now. So I think we should probably go back to it and better understand what happened during the Arabic Spring to inform us into the future. Hmm. Underlining as well, yeah. kind of the, the, the multidimensionality yeah, of, the, yeah. of the issue that, uh, yeah. that was mentioned uh, uh, a couple of times. Um, Roman, before we um, slowly move over to, um, to your questions that I'm looking forward to, um, as, as we have as the, 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 the topic of the day, um, cities, is the, um, you know, based, based on your, your research, you mentioned kind of the, in, the, the, the substantial increase of um, population uh, numbers, densely populated areas, um, uh, you know, from, from rural areas to the cities. Um, can, can you underline a bit more kind of wh where, how this gets affected by, by climate change and, and, and enhanced and intensified by climate change? Yes, thank you. So one of the drivers of the climate change and environmental change processes more broadly, they are one of the drivers that affect migration into cities, basically. So by undermining the livelihoods that in rural areas, for example, we see um, that, for example, in, in sub-Saharan Africa, an uh, ever larger share of the population is moving towards cities and then basically contributing to this increase in population sizes and the uh, urban uh, urbanization trends in these areas. Um, it is. And this also links to what was said before. It's not only these environmental mm. drivers that play a role, but it is often um, they are compounded with other factors that, of course, play a role. These can be economic, sociopolitical factors, um, as well as demographic factors that, that can shape migration decisions of households and can ultimately um, contribute, to, contribute to these trends that we are observing empirically. So it is really always um, a, a combination of different factors that comes into play determining whether we see um, changes or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I have already one question here um, on, my, uh, on my display uh, regarding uh, nutrition, diet, affordability uh, of nutrition. Um, do the percentages of the populations unable to afford nutritious food take into account that in certain regions, including Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia, uh, which score low in the table shown, households grow more food themselves? You know, if, 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 if prices go up, you know, that you mentioned resilience as, as, as a factor, you know, that this would be one of the reactions, so to say? Um, yeah, this would be the ideal situation we need to work towards that household resilience is increased. Mm -hmm. But this requires certainly to improve production systems. And um, giving you one example, going back to the egg story, uh, backyard poultry um, means that there's very low productivity. And this um, is, makes uh, eggs really scarce and expensive compared to, to cereal grains. Comparing uh, the cost of calories of cereal grains to an egg, then an egg is in Sub-Saharan Africa up to 20 times more expensive on a calorie basis. But on a nutrient density basis, the egg is then certainly more advisable, specifically for vulnerable groups. So if we would assist setting up a production system that um, increase um, the production and also the income of the farmers, uh, then we have the ability yeah, really to improve nutrition 
through better acts, but also uh, reduce poverty. And there's certainly another element that I'm very concerned about when uh, we have this backyard poultry, the chicken are running through the house on the whole compound, and the small children get in touch mm. with the chicken feces, they are at risk of diarrhea and of a leaky gut, which leads to undernutrition. Mm -hmm. So we have, again, thinking holistically, what is the system we want to improve and to tackle the different elements, basically also of sustainability. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But this requires extension services, yeah. capacity building, and it requires investment in these uh, populations. And official uh, development aid is not targeting necessarily uh, food and nutrition to the extent we would like to see. Mm -hmm. Let's open it up to the audience here. Yeah, we have first Roland, yeah. Do we have a microphone for the... Uh... <laughs> Thanks. Um, thinking holistically, I think that was uh, one of the red threads or this when, where, where the three inputs really came together, that things are complex, multidimensional, and so on. So thinking holistically, okay, I, I get that. Now, if we move over to acting holistically, how optimistic are you that, uh, or how many, do you see initiatives, practical work to get to a holistic uh, response? Um, I'm saying this because in, in my practice, we're working on, well, contributing to better aid in conflict just getting the humanitarians, the development people, the conflict people to work together, to coordinate stuff. It's not working. The international system agencies are not set up for holistic, for delivering holistic responses in a way. So I get the message from, from research. How do we get it into, into practice? Do you have examples of holistic integrated responses um, that you're part of or that you're seeing that could give us some hope. Thanks. Thank you very much. Yeah, that, that would have, in fact, been also one of my questions to, uh, to Roman, but uh, Barbara is raising her hand. Thanks. Um, I think uh, weathering risk uh, as an initiative um, is a great uh, step in the right direction in this regard. Um, we, our project is not uh, purely um, a scientific project or doesn't have only uh, the aim to improve sort of uh, understanding of climate related conflicts, but also to, um, uh, to improve the action. And um, this is um, what we, uh, this is why we have all, why we collaborate with the consultancy Adelphi who, who has a lot of, uh, with whom we have a kind of a portfolio of, of stakeholders uh, with whom we um, um, discuss uh, how to analyze conflicts, how to, how to address them, um, how they need to be addressed in, in order not to um, increase climate, climatic vulnerabilities of uh, affected households. Um, so we are really trying to um, to take the research step further and uh, and collaborate with um, with uh, different um, uh, local institutions and uh, and the governments um, and uh, help them to use our tool to assess the conflict and to act on it in order not to reinforce uh, pre-existing vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, Roman, please. Thank you very much. It's an excellent question. And this is, of course, one of the basically core challenges, I guess, that is exists for translating um, some of these insights also that we have presented here into actual policy and into meaningful policy as well. I also see it critical, um, the issue of basically making policy makers and uh, making them find a way to, to address these issues holistically, to think outside of the box, outside of the silos, 
Um, yet there is um, some interesting initiatives, I would say, that try to move there in this direction more and more. Um, we have been, for example, in touch with the African um, Climate Mobility Initiative that it has been uh, launched, uh, I believe, last year, which tries to go more this way, involving um, different stakeholders at different stages, um, uh, including also at the international level, so that uh, basically countries can better coordinate among each other. Um, there is also um, a range of uh, regional examples. So particularly at the regional level, I have the impression that exchanges between different stakeholders um, also at the international level um, work better than at the, um, at the, the, the um, higher scale multilateral levels. Um, and what is also interesting, especially when we talk about the topic of cities, is that cities increasingly start connecting um, with connecting each other, connect to each other. There's, for example, the climate resilience initiative, the cities climate resilience initiative, um, where cities basically try to um, to to find innovative ways and learn from each other on how to improve climate uh, resilience in an urban context. And I think these are best practice cases that can really. Um, be useful to, to learn and how we can improve on this uh, challenge of finding holistic solutions and also getting everyone on board to basically uh, jointly um, move this, these topics forward. Mm. Thank you very much. Do you want yeah. to comment briefly? Yeah, as one well? example also from the food and nutrition sector. Um, in 2010, the Scaling Up Nutrition Movement was formed to bring the different stakeholders and sectors into one, under one tent, from UN, private sector, um, and civil society, to um, initiate programs uh, that are sustainable for improving nutrition. And just last year, we had the Food Systems Summit, a United Nations initiative, where we have many excellent uh, uh, projects suggested a lot of good intention, but that has now to, to really um, be um, implemented. And I don't know how it will pan out. With good intention, it's not sufficient, but it's about having the right incentives for all different groups involved in that. But I'm very optimistic that we are moving because it's now recognized uh, climate change, for instance, is one of our aspects we need to address in food systems transformation, and maybe the incentives is coming from there because of the high attention of also the political system on climate change, that we are, we are putting our shoulders together and uh, try to, to work also together. Thank you. We, we, had, we had, no? Then, then we have another. <laughs> Hello. Um, I, jo I joined a bit later. Um, but I heard this very interesting notion of what Mr. Hoffman mentioned. It's about this exchange that cities conduct. And maybe after a long day to also bring a, a, my, my thought where I appreciate this exchange, where I participate in this exchange. But there are so many of these platforms at the moment. There's an ICLE platform. There's an IUCN platform. There's a covenant of mayors. The UNEC in, in Geneva does it. In Brussels, there are networks and networks, right? 100 resilient cities, C40. So um, I feel now we did almost, the exchange should never stop, but we have to you know, now come to a point where we, I think we realize what our problems are, and we, I think we know more or less about each other, right? So we don't have to, so I, I've listened to the same and same presentations of a mayor in a, let's say, a Southeast Asian or German city, and I think um, it, it becomes a sort of almost like a conference keynote hopping, where the mayors fly in, fly out. And then when you work <laughs> with, the, with the city government, when you go down to the head of uh, spatial planning, when you go head of water management, they do not profit from this high level exchange that happens with, among mayors. So I feel you know, we have to kind of somehow sediment it down inside the city government and, uh, and maybe also you know, go forward from this fora and go most in co-creative workshops when you really treat a place where you, where you gather, right? So you don't meet in a, in a five-star hotel and then fly and fly out. You, you really deal if you meet in Marseille or we meet in Mannheim. Mm. I think it's good to, to make uh, this place you know, special and, and make also this knowledge stay in the place. So in this sense, yes, let's continue the exchange, but make it more impactful. Mm -hmm. 
Ro Roman had been smiling occasionally. No, no, no he doesn't anymore. Do, do you want to comment I, I briefly? I, I just would like to say that I agree with the comment, and uh, it's of course more than just the exchange, and of course there's also the risk of having basically an, an overload of these of these networks. And I myself not so familiar with these um, city X, these various city um, networks and platforms that you have mentioned, but of course I mean there can be um, a certain overload, and it's about going beyond just exchanging and also acting upon what we what we what we know already and it's it's about involving local communities as well and, and basically making sure that this knowledge and also the, the 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 drive to 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 have to to bring a change trickles down also to um to those people that are affected and can make a difference also at a more local level so i fully agree with, with what you had said and thank you for this comment mm -hmm. yes please Thank you, uh, Owen Fraser from Helvetas. Uh, really, thank you to all three panelists. That was a lot of information in a short space of time, and all of it really interesting. I would be interested in your reflections uh, on this notion of climate resilience and the connection between climate resilience and conflict prevention. So I think we talked a lot about connections between conflict uh, or climate driving conflict, but have you any examples of how communities and how places become more climate resilient uh, by dealing with their conflicts, and particularly their conflicts that are, are linked or driven by climate change, and what are the specific kind of... Is there something specific about conflict prevention when it comes to dealing with uh, conflicts driven by climate? Mm -hmm. Very good question, very interesting one. Any? Um, maybe I can uh, step in and give a very brief input. So, I mean, one of the ways to go forward uh, could be are, are the environmental peacekeeping or peace building initiatives that try, um, you know, try to in, uh, incorporate into peace building and uh, conflict pre prevention um, methods, uh, measures, or try to consider not um, destroying environment or uh, simultaneously uh, create synergies uh, um, by making households uh, more uh, resilient and, and through that they also prevent this kind of vicious, vicious circle of um, uh, sort of being um, vulnerable to climate change, which is simultaneously a driver of conflict, which again um, kind of um, imposes uh, adverse impact on, on agriculture uh, incomes and uh, leads to a sort of um, displacement of people. So I think um, environmental peace building, um, which considers a climatic and um, environmental aspect is uh, an important uh, step in the right direction. Any comments from? Yeah, a comment on household resilience and food security specifically. Um, I mentioned in my presentation a mycotoxin, aflatoxin, which grows um, in a humid environment. And aflatoxin um, is problematic because of its effect on human health and um, also on, on nutrition status. Um, if you would equip households or cooperatives with the right trying methodology, like solar dryer, to reduce the moisture content of the crops immediately after harvest, then this risk is to a large degree mitigated. So it's again about transfer of knowledge and technology, simple technology that can be deployed in a local context. And I think there is a, a more opportunities to uh, consider simple technologies that make a tremendous uh, difference. One uh, other example was many years back in, in Bangladesh, they introduced um, diesel engines from China at a very low cost, $200, using as water pumps, but also for blowing. And this has had a tremendous impact on the uh, production of food, but it was simple technology, and we have to, to think about technology that we can adopt in a local context so that it makes most sense for the population and it's affordable. Mm -hmm. Maybe 
one last question. We are, we are approaching the end. One quick question and a quick answer. <sighs> Sorry if the lady here was uh, faster. Hello. Uh, maybe you can uh, bilaterally <laughs> uh, raise your question. Yes, please. I would like to ask a question about food and uh, nutrition. Um, you know, the, the price, when the price increased, and um, so far, as I know, in China, we don't have enough land, enough uh, area to produce the food. And then they must produce a, a, a much food in, um, in a lab, in the a, in a production, and then nutrition uh, quality is going down. And another side is this um, uh, pollutions. Even you eat the best of the food, and then from the pollution, it's also damaged your health. Yeah. Mm. How can how can you uh, solve this problem? <laughs> <laughs> so it's um, in one minute. In one minute, um, it's almost a catch twenty two. Uh, but yeah, pollution is is a matter that uh, I think has to be uh, reduced. Uh, in and uh, this one aspect, but uh, the the quality of the diet on having the right uh, crops and the right um, inputs to grow high quality food, I think this is something that can be implemented, and other type of contamination can also be reduced. For instance, uh, in vertical urban farming, mm -hmm. they are not relying on pesticides for for uh, vegetable production or um, other contaminants. It's, it's a totally safe and nutritious food. So I think it's, again, deploying feasible technology uh, in a specific context, adapted to the context. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we have to come to an end. Thank you to all of my three panelists. Um, thank you to you here and at home. Um, the conflict researcher Herbert Kalman coined the term strategic optimism. So not, not being naive, but also not completely devastated and pessimistic. And I hope that some of our inputs here gave you uh, yeah, some possible action points and ideas for high impact interventions and pivot points in these different areas. Um, we have a short break here, and after that, we have a panel with mayors from different cities. Thank you very much. Thank you.